Facebook page. So you can access that uh, if you want to listen to it once again. OK, we are on recording mode. So let me start by uh, thanking you once again for joining in. Uh, now, this is Ryder's translation. And we are going to today look at two aspects of Panchatantra, the introduction to the text as such, and uh, the first six stories of Kakolukium, the crows and owls. Right. If you see, these are the five segments of the text. As you can see, uh, the loss of friends, the winning of friends, Mitra Bheda and Mitra Labha, the Kakulukium, which is part and parcel of uh, our syllabus. Now, if you take a look at the first six books, you will uh, six stories, you will see that the first story is about uh, the, the crows and the owls at present. I would say when the story is being written. And there is another inset narrative of the crows and the owls earlier. So what caused the enmity between the crows and the owls? And then there are inset narratives which talk about particular uh, morals or particular niti as such particular praxis of behavior. Now, why choose Crows and Owls? Why have I not chosen the other books? First and foremost is that it offers us a sizable number of narratives. So 18 tales in total, which gives us a kind of a flavor of the Poncho Tantra. The second reason which I chose is that this is completely dedicated, more or less, towards the political idea of, you know, how the king should behave and how, you know, the king should accept and decline counsel and what is the result of proper counsel and improper counsel. So, in a certain sense, I am trying to alert you to the fact that the Panchatantra is a deeply political text with its intention of fashioning a proper king and talking about judgment that is to be exercised in times of a crisis. So in a sense, I am arguing in this case that the Panchatantra, as the introduction will shortly tell you, is about how a king should behave, how strategies will be made, and how, you know, if necessary, the king needs to be merciless and deceptive. Right? So in that sense, you know, it ties in nicely with, say, Chanukko's Orthoshastra or Sun Tzu's The Art of War as a kind of manual for uh, regal or kingly behavior. Right? But before I go into that, let me take a quick look at what is the main narrative. Right. Unfortunately, this particular PDF is a little difficult. But uh, let me quickly come to the introduction. Now, yesterday I mentioned that uh, the prose alter I'm sorry, the text alternates between verse and prose. And I suggested that the tale or the story is told in prose, while the moral of the story is often provided in verse. Now, how the Sanskrit works will obviously be explained by uh, the professor whom I have invited to uh, give you a flavor of the Sanskrit, since I do not know the language. But take a look at the translation. 
And you see the introduction one Vishnu Sharmanan shrewdly gleaning all worldly wisdom's inner meaning. Now, it's very interesting, again, as many of you will be working out, the Panchatantra is based on worldly wisdom. So we are not talking merely about the Vedas, for example, or the holy texts, scriptures, as it were. This is a manual of life and how life actually operates and how the king should operate. And he also talks about wisdom. So there is this distinction very clearly made between knowledge and wisdom and the way in which, you know, information, uh, particular study of disciplines is transferred into wisdom only and only if you can apply it at the opportune moment. There's also this suggestion that wisdom is often related with experience. So the greatest teacher is not merely books, but an exposure to real life situations. And that is where the fables come in so useful, because these fables, they are in reality certain life situations which therefore provide this gateway into knowledge and wisdom. So all worldly wisdom's inner meaning. And you can see how a writer has maintained that versification that the, the, the couplets operating. This is gleaning meaning is a couplet. If you look at the rhyme, it's AA and then comes BB. In these five books, the charm compresses of all such books that the world possesses. Now, this is also a kind of what we call an invocation. What does an invocation do in an epic? In an epic, the invocation states the subject matter of the poem, and it also announces the greatness of this particular text. So in a way, Panchatantra is the introduction is an invocation to Panchatantra, announcing that it is one, one of the greatest storehouses of wisdom. And secondly, it announces that it is a repository of worldly wisdom. That is the subject matter of the text. And then there's the southern country that is referred to. And therefore, the thesis that we were discussing yesterday that Panchatantra was originally located in the south is a city called Maiden's Delight. They lived, uh, that is Mahila Ropaya, they lived a king named Immortal Power, Amura Shukti in the Sanskrit, right? Immortal Power. And he says he was familiar with the workings of the wise conduct of life. His feet were made dazzling by the tangle of rays of light. And therefore, Amara Shakti or immortal power is an ideal king in that sense of the term who has both power, pomp and wisdom. And then he has three sons. Their names were rich power, fierce power, endless power. And then comes uh, the satire. They were supreme blockhead. So the three sons were worthless. Now, when the king perceived that they were hostile to education, he calls his uh, counselors and says, gentlemen, it is known to you that these sons of mine are lacking in discernment, judgment. You see, there are certain words which you, when you are uh, sort of uh, looking at, I want you to underline discernment, knowledge. Now, what is discernment? Discernment is from a wealth of information, how you can pick out particular or useful knowledge, discernment, judgment. So when I behold them, you see, one of the themes of the Panchatantra is choice. What are the choices that are available before kings? And which choice is the wise choice? That is what is being uh, sort of pointed out to. So when I behold them, my kingdom brings me no happiness. 
though all external thorns are drawn. For there is wisdom in the proverb. You see, uh, I am referring to, of course, uh, a person, Aditi probably asked me yesterday, or Shagorika, I, I, I'm not very sure, but uh, how you know the verse and the prose are continuously sort of intermingling with each other. Of sons unborn or dead or fools, unborn or dead will do. They cause a little grief, no doubt, but fools a long life through. So uh, an unworthy son or an unworthy child is uh, a difficulty to be uh, sort of carried on throughout life. And then again, to what good purpose can a cow that brings no calf nor milk be bent? Or why beget a son who proves a dunce and disobedient? Dunce is a fool and disobedient, of course, somebody who does not listen. So once again, this is the first of the morals of the Stuponcho Tantra, that a useless son is a pain in life throughout. Right. And then, of course, there's this idea about human intelligence and human personality being fashioned. Right. So this is the classical idea that what does knowledge do? Knowledge is not abstract for itself. Knowledge is only useful when it can transform base matter into gold. Right. Base matter, lead into gold. So knowledge has this capacity to transform the individual, to fashion a gentleman. Right. Now, this is an idea which you'll find later on also in Spencer, Edmund Spencer. Spencer has this epic called The Fairy Queen. And in The Fairy Queen, he says that the poem is meant to fashion a gentleman of noble virtue and discipline. Right. So there are two ideas in Spencer, virtue and discipline. Similarly, Vishnu Sharma is also arguing that the capacity of narrative lies in its ability to or knowledge to fashion a gentleman. And there's also another very important aspect is this question of pedagogy. What is pedagogy? Pedagogy is the art of teaching. Right. So how does one teach somebody who is not interested in learning. Right. That's very important. You see, there are various categories of students, some unintelligent, some intelligent but lazy, and some intelligent but hardworking. So how does one go about teaching and fashioning the king's personality? That is what Vishnu Sharma is trying to uh, 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 sort of uh, point out the key. This incidentally is being narrated by the king. So you you please remember something. Which tale is being narrated by who, and to which reader or to which listener? It act a chart. Kintu, this is the chart that all of you will make for me. Kakulukion. Who is the narrator of the tale? What is the tale about? And who is the listener of the tale? Whom is it being narrated to? That will give you an idea of how many tales are told by which character and who is the most important of them all. And then comes the counselors and say, so king, first one learns grammar in 12 years and then one masters books on religion and practical life. So you have a manual of what classical Indian learning would have been like. It would have been grammar and rhetoric for 12 years. Then uh, it becomes, that is Vyakaran, right? And then there is Dharma, and then there is practical life. So there's an enormous span that is taken to master a subject. Then the intelligence awakens. And then one of the counselors says time is limited. The verbal sciences require much time for mastery. Therefore, let some kind of epitome be devised. There's a proverb that says, and see, once again, notice how frequently, how very frequently 
verse and prose alternate. Since verbal science has no final end, since life is short and obstacles impend, let central facts be picked and firmly fixed as swans extract the milk with water mixed. Can any of you briefly unmute yourself and tell me what that figure of speech is? Let central facts be picked and firmly fixed as swans extract the milk with water mixed. Any volume? Simile? Yes, very good. That is a simile. What is a simile? A simile is a rhetorical figure of comparison where two unlike objects are sort of uh, compared. So what is the counselor trying to say? The counselor is trying to say that from the facts or from the information that the student receives, he must be able to pick out like a swan the milk from the water, right? So he must be able to take out the essence, the best, from a lot of information. Now keep that in mind. What is the Panchatantra doing? The Panchatantra is obviously suggesting that a new pedagogy needs to be evolved, where learning should be through narrative rather than through dry discourse. And from this narrative, you must be able to glean out, like a swan, milk from the water. So there are, as it were, tales which are like water, from which the knowledge, the milk, has to be gleaned out. And he says, now there's a Brahmin called Vishnu Sharman with a reputation for competence in numerous sciences, and he will certainly make them intelligent in a twinkling. And then, of course, the king calls Vishnu Sharma and re in return offers to bestow land. And Vishnu Sharma makes an interesting answer. He says, I'm not a man to sell good learning for a hundred land grants. Right. But he says in six months, I will make them acquainted with the art of intelligent living. I want you to under underline that line again or write it down somewhere. Intelligent living. You see what this will do. You know, if you un underline phrases which strike you, is to locate the central theme of the Panchatantra. Intelligent living. Right. Once again, not esoteric learning, not abstract learning, but learning which can be applied in life. Application. Notice these two words. Theoretical knowledge, theory. And praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. Praxis is its application, right? So, but if I do not in six months' time make the boys acquainted with the art of intelligent living, I will give up my own name. Listen to my lion roar. Once again, you see how there are certain metaphors here. Metaphor is a hidden simile. He's comparing himself to a lion. Is how the beast and the human are continually being intertwined within the text. Let us cut the matter short. My boasting arises from no greed of cash. But in order that your request be granted, I will show a sporting spirit. If I fail to render your sons in six months' time, then your majesty is at liberty to show me his majestic bare bottom. Now, that's not a very good uh, reference, is it? But you see, once again, what I wanted you to notice is that there's a certain folk, rustic, uh, bodily humor associated with uh, the stories and the narratives of Panchatantra. In fact, a lot of these Panchatantra deals with the concept of calm, desire, right? So. There are cuckolded husbands, there are sexually aroused wives. And sexual desire is, as it were, one of the integral parts of the Panchatantra, right? 
So it is not as if it talks only about king and power, but it will also talk about sexuality in human life, deviances, and the need to uh, sort of bring all this within a structure of control. Also, as intelligent students now, you will notice what are the gender assumptions of the text? Is it misogynistic? How does it look at women? In fact, what is the relationship between man and woman in Poncho Tantra? are questions that you should now start asking. And therefore, you will find that in a lot of these texts, uh, as was in the, that particular age, uh, you'll have to situate it in its context, of course. It is a deeply patriarchal and misogynistic text where the woman is seen as largely a possession of the man, one, and secondly, uh, seen as a source of uh, misconduct, often inciting people into action. Right? This you will see not so much in Kakulukia, but in the other tales of the Panchatantra. For example, of course, the crocodile wife who ruins the friendship between the crocodile and the monkey in her blind desire to have the heart of the, to eat the heart of the monkey so what are the gender relations between uh, these uh, uh, between uh, people is also something which you should be alert to at this point of time so what am i asking you to when you are reading your texts I'm asking you to underline lines and phrases which you think are important and locate through them the themes of the text. I'm asking you to see the gender relations. I'm asking to look at the approaches to sexuality within the Panchatantra. And I'm, of course, because the question yesterday rose, asking you to look at these questions of what is moral, what is praxis, and what kind of a behavior should a king self fashion himself into right what should be the niti right these are things which of course i would ask you to keep on looking at keep on exploring and then the king's uh, a brahmin's uh, a king is penetrated with wonder now this is also again something which uh, is what the reader would or what the listener would be uh, feeling. Now, you see, every tale, and when you look at a narrative, every tale has a narrator and a narrati, right? Now, I will later on give you Yeoman Jakobson's Matrix, where, you know, Jakobson talks about what a tale does, or what a tale, T A A L. The narrative does. What is narrative? After all, it is a mode of communication. A story is trying to send a particular message. And that message is being coded into language. Right. Now, think about yourself. You, you just, just think about this. You say cat, right? That's a word which all of you are familiar with. Right. But if somebody does not know English and you go and tell him cat, it won't make any sense to him. But if you tell him meow, he will probably understand. So you have to understand that language is a kind of a code. And it is through that language that the message is being transferred. Right. And the person is receiving the message and reacting to it. So this is what the response of the reader is. So there is an authorial sending of the message and the reader's construction, reconstruction or response to that message. So what is the obvious response that Vishnu Sharma wants is of wonder of how so much knowledge can be distilled into so easy tales. And that is the magic of Panchatantra, you see, that the Panchatantra, in the guise of simplicity and imagination, in the beast fable, is packing within itself a whole wealth of 
both information and knowledge. Right? It's simplicity and imagination are the two qualities that make Panchatantra such a very, very interesting text for us. Anyways, so uh, meanwhile, Vishnu Sharma took the book boys, went home, made them learn by heart five books. And these are the five books which we've talked about. And then the princes learned, and six months they answered the prescription. Since that day, this work on the art of intelligent living called Panchatantra or the five books has traveled the world aiming at the awakening of intelligence in the young. To sum the matter up, whoever learns the work by heart or through the storyteller's art becomes acquainted. The storyteller, because, uh, you know, of course, this is a reference to them being narrated to people as part of oral culture, becomes acquainted his life by sad defeat, although the king of Heaven be his foe, is never tainted. Now, there are two components here in that particular uh, poem, poem, poetic section, is that, you know, there is wisdom in Panchatantra. And the second is that, despite evil luck or despite adverse circumstances, the person's heart is never tainted. So the Panchatantra is also a way of coping with adversity and ill luck. Now, uh, once again, if you remember your O. Henry, for those of you who have studied the gift of the Magi, for example, short story. O. Henry makes this point that life is made out of uh, laugh, laughter, sobs and snifles and that you know, life is more grief than happiness. So Panchatantra, in a sense, is a way of coping with grief and happiness in with equanimity, right? With uh, the same kind of response. So there are certain issues about uh, the classical way of accepting life in all its ups and downs that the Panchatantra is also talking about. Let me therefore sum up quickly what the Panchatantra's introduction has told us. It has told us that the story is a repository of wisdom told in easy tales and that if one learns the Panchatantra, he will glean wisdom about practical living. The Panchatantra is not about esoteric knowledge, but it is practical living, short stories told with a dose of wisdom, that the tale and the proverb are all welded together and the tale is told so that the proverb can be delivered or the knowledge can be delivered. Therefore, utility of the text is more important than its dulce, but also very importantly that knowledge can be delivered through short tales and therefore that becomes an effective way of pedagogy, of teaching, and that it is through knowledge that foolish men can be fashioned into wise kings. It is also elaborated the context that this is primarily a book which was intended for princes. But if you see it in a wider context, then the Panchatantra is not merely about the manual of kings, but equally about the behavior of the common people. So it widens itself out into uh, practical behavior. Now, there's this question which we had yesterday and it set me thinking about morality, ethics, practical behavior. You see, once again, uh, the Panchatantra has a very, very problematic sense of morality. Right? You, you have, of course, this tale which you will study in Kakulukya, 
about a wife uh, who is young and the husband has married once again. So he's, he's old. So the old husband and the young wife and the young wife never submits to the to the desires of the old husband. And there's this thief who comes into the house and the wife in a fit of you know, fear clings on to the husband. And the husband tells the thief, you take whatever you want, you know, because you have been responsible for my wife embracing me. Now, once again, what is the moral of that story is a very deeply problematic moral. So when we are looking at the Panchatantra, you know, the Panchatantra is a text that is primarily directed towards self-endeavor and happiness of the narrator primarily, right? So it is, you know, the owls are defeated by deceit. So we are not looking at strictly morality here, but, you know, questions about survival and individual happiness. And for that, the Panchatantra will allow some degrees of deviation from morality. So one of the questions that was asked, and I thought about it quite for quite some time yesterday, and that is what makes the text so very interesting, is how does one approach the moral question of Panchatantra? And if you extend that, is the morality of the king different from the morality of the ordinary human being? What about deceit? What about inappropriate behavior? What about lying, for example? Is that permissible? These are some of the questions that the Panchatantra puts before you, right? And tries to explain through its, its verse passages what is proper and what is improper. You might agree with it equally. You might disagree with it. But the narrative forces you to actually engage with questions about behavior in practical life. Right. That is why I wanted you to read the introduction to the Panchatantra in some details. Right. I will quickly move over to Kakulukiyam. Uh, Give me a moment here. Sorry, just just bear with me. Yes. Ah, there you go. This is the problem with the PDF. You have to go exactly. I'm sorry, I, I should have been better prepared, maybe with two uh, projections of the same text. Right, so here begins then book three called Crows and Owls, which treats, and then you have straight on, he talks about the subject matter of peace, war, and so forth. And therefore, these are some of the first glimps, glimpses of, of the morality of that of, of war, actually. Uh, reconciled although be he, never trust an enemy. For the cave of owls was burned when the cry crows with fire returned. So an enemy is never to be trusted. That's the moral. And how was that, asked the princes, and Vishnu Sharma told the following story. So the first tale of crows and owls, if you make a note there, is the story of told by Vishnu Sharma. The listeners is the print, are the princes. And the story is about the crows and the owls. So the broadest narrative here. 
আবার বলছি দের আর সার্টেন কনসেন্ট্রিক সার্কেলস হিয়ার বুঝতে পেরেছ সো দের ইজ অ্যান আউটার সার্কেল হুইচ ইজ বিষ্ণু শর্মা অ্যান্ড দ্য ফাইভ প্রিন্সেস দের আর ফাইভ ইনার সার্কেলস ওয়ান ইজ মিত্র লাভ মিত্র ভেদ অ্যান্ড অঞ্চুয়ং কাকুলুকিয়ম উইদিন কাকুলুকিয়ম অফ কোর্স দের ইজ the story of the crows and the owls that's the outer circle and then there are inner circles again how the crows and the owls became enemies and so on and so forth right so in the southern country is called earth base near it stands a great banyan tree with countless branches and therefore you have the crow king called cloudy with a cloudless countless retinue of crows and there is this uh rival king a uh, great owl named fo crusher or idomon had it forced fortress and his habitation in a mountain cave right and he has his retinue of owls so you have two competing kings within the same uh, terrain as it were so this owl king cherished a grudge now the grudge is a, the reason for that grudge is an important part of the narrative so that whenever he met a crow in his earrings he killed him and passed on right so uh, gradually spread rings of dead crows about the banyan tree and he says and once again you see this continuous uh, movement between the prose and the verse if you permit disease of foe to march unheeded you may know that death awaits you sure if slow so once again you see how this is an interesting poem isn't it because it talks not only about the enemy but it also talks about disease as the enemy which if it grows will ultimately kill you and says uh, our enemy is arrogant so my point being that while it is talking about kingship and how the king should behave it is also talking equally about everyday life and disease and how disease if untreated will result in much more serious conditions right so uh then he talks about and he turns to his counselors and this is very interesting you see that the structure of society is such that the king while he is the one who will be making the choice always falls back upon his counselors for his available choices right so you know the panchatantra suggests that any problem might have n number of ways of approaching it and wisdom lies in the correct choice to be made of the options and that politics or the science of politics offers you x number of correct choices so every choice may be a valid choice under a certain circumstance but within one particular circumstance what is the best choice to be made so the panchatantra is also about the theme of panchatantra one of the major themes of panchatantra is the correct choice so uh he says there are six possibilities peace war change of base entrenchment alliances and duplicity so the king is aware of which uh what are the choices available to him and this is when i ask you to you know see that it is very transparently human isn't it when the text is talking about crows it is actually not about crows at all it is about the human world so the human and the and the non human world and the animal world in panchatantra are interchangeable are very you know there's a very fuzzy boundary between the human and the non human so that you know the animal world is in reality the human world right so the saying goes good counselors should tell their king and ask a profitable thing if asked they should advise so who is a good counselor and who is a good king the good counselor therefore 
should tell their king an asked profitable thing. While flatterers who shun the true are foremen in disguise. Right. So if a king believes in flattery and trusts flatterers as counselors, then his end will be poor. So it's a, a kind of a lesson which is quickly implanted into the text. So therefore, it is now pros proper to confer in secret session. So there are five, you know, ancestral counselors. Uh, am I audible? Uh, there's a sudden sound. Just unmute yourself and tell me one of you that I'm audible. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yes. Sir. So uh, then Cloudy starts to consult his five ancestral counselors. And live again replies, O oh, king, one should not make war with a powerful enemy. So he has his own logic. He says, bow your head before the great, lifting it when times beseem, and prosperity will flow even onward like a stream. Right. So this is one option. Make your peace with him who won't this to conquer in a fight. Otherwise, other foes will bend their necks to you, fearful of his might. And he goes on. So you see, once again, there are uh, <clears throat> there are well ways in which he is continuously moving and putting his advice. To sum it up, never struggle with the strong. If you wish to know my mind, who has seen a cloud baffle the opposing wind? So his suggestion, suggestion number one, is submit and surrender. The king says to live well. You give your option now. And he says, I disagree. In as much the enemy is cruel, greedy, and unprincipled, you should not make peace with him. With foes unprincipled and false, it is vain to seek accommodation. And therefore, you should fight. So in a certain sense, there are two options here. One is that you accept that the foe is strong. Both All the counselors accept that. Now, the question is whether to fight or whether to give up, whether to submit or go away, fly away. So there are actually two options, to engage or disengage. And if you want to engage, how are you to engage with the enemy? Right. So we have been humiliated by him. Therefore, if you propose peace, he will be angry and employ violence again. Once again, he's very right in this way because the owl kills not the crow, not by anger, but by an ancient grudge. Right. So uh, then comes again, when kings are merciless as death, all foes are quick to knuckle under. And then comes live along. And live along says, oh, king, the enemy is vicious and powerful and unscrupulous. Only a change of base can be recommended. So don't make war. Don't make peace. Let's all go away from this place. Right. So far, we have not had any tail. There's no separate tail within as yet. Right. The king said to live on. My worthy sir, may pray express your opinion. And he disapproves of all the three. And he says, very importantly, a crocodile at home can beat an elephant. But if he goes abroad, a dog can make him pant. You know, so many proverbs have come in from the Panchatantra, as it were. Uh, you have this saying, of course, Nijade Golite Kukuro Raja. But, uh, well, you can now see how it is the Panchatantra which has become a storehouse of these kind of sayings, as it were. So he, his option is, uh, of course, that uh, you cannot go away from your own place and stand firm resolve or to do or die. So living can earn renown or dead the starry sky. And then he says uh, to live long. And live long suggests that we have to have alliance to deft and though deft and brilliant. What good end can you attain without a friend? The fire that seems immortal will die when fanning wind, when the fanning wind is still. So between them, they have given the options that are available to the king. So finally, as it were, Cloudy comes before an ancient 
So once again, the thesis that experience, that knowledge is not learned only from books, but experience in life, far-sighted counselor of his race. And this is a crow word preserved to the last page of every textbook of social ethics. And his name was Livestrong. And he says, Father, I had a secret purpose of questioning the others in your very presence. And you listen, might listen to everything and instruct me as to what is fitting. Now, look at this. The king has said that, you know, yours is the advice that I'll finally take. I asked the others so that you could listen to them. Right. So this is a king who trusts its people. Right. So pray instruct me in the appropriate course of action. And he says, my son, all these have proposed it's drawn from the textbooks of social ethics. And all is highly proper, each course in its own good time. That every advice, every choice might be possible and plausible, but its context has to be right. You have to identify your exact enemy and then act accordingly. So these are all viable options, but in this particular context, what is the most viable option? But the present hour demands, and that is your word to be underlined once again, very clearly, duplicity, shrewdness, feigning, get, getting a guerrilla warfare, putting a mole inside the enemy, right? You must regard with like distrust both peace and warlike measures. Must seek through duplicity your goal with powerful foes of evil soul. And in this way, who themselves trust nobody and have a single eye to self-interest can win the trust of an enemy and easily destroy him. Shrewd enemies will cause a foe whom they will ruin first to grow. The flow of mucus by molasses is first increased, but later passes. So it says we have to, we have to undergo a process of deception and destroy him. And then the king puts his problem that I don't know where the owls reside, so how can I destroy him, right? And he says, I will do it. So Livestrong actually voluntarily sort of proposes that he will find the habitat out and he will destroy them. Crows see a thing by sense of smell. While the scripture serves the Brahmin well, the king perceives by means of spies and other creatures use their eyes. Now, you see, now this discourse suddenly turns to the question of the spies. You see, in, in, in warfare, once again, or in uh, statecraft, in the politics of statecraft, spies play a very important role in the gleaning of information. But of course, you now know, as Foucault has suggested, that information is power, right? So spies become the most secret weapons of a state in bringing in proper information, right? And therefore, you know, Chanakya, for example, Sun Tzu, for example, all of them talk about the role of spies in statecraft, right? And he says, who are the king's functionaries? Right, that what is Livestrong doing? He's telling the king, who are your most important counselors? Who are the most important functionaries of the state, as it were? So what is the number? Of what character are secret service men? Play tell. And he says, on this point, the sage Narada gave the following information. In the hostile camp are 18 functionaries in one's own 15. The four has 18 functionaries and you have eight and 10. Give each as unknown secretaries, three service men. Right, so who are the uh, functionaries in the hostile camp? The counselor, the chaplain, the commander in chief, the crown prince, the coincidence, the superintendent of the gynaceum, the advisor, the tax collector, the introducer, master of ceremonies, the treasurer, and so on and so forth. 
but the important word is here the counselor now, you will see that four strong equally has his counselors and he too has a wise counselor but he does not choose to listen to him so the king the choice of the king and his counselor becomes very important for the state right by sowing intrigue among these the enemy is subdued so when can one subdue an enemy by sowing discord within them you will see how four catcher and red eye sort of disagree amongst themselves and only when red eye the other counselor of the owl has disappeared or has left the king that live strong will initiate the proceedings of the destruction of the owls so once again as you can see my point being in the guise of simple tales the panchatantra is a deeply political text about warfare and statecraft right as the saying goes uh, and it says father said cloudy what is the origin of the deadly feud between crows and owls well i think we have made a couple of very important points and i will stop here for the time being uh slightly behind maybe from schedule but then this being a first year class let me gradually read the text with you and try and see how every literary text can be marked and the themes can be brought out so we'll take up the next uh, tale as it were in the next class because i want to give you a little bit of time also to ask your questions and with your permission therefore i will stop the recording now